Hello everyone, good evening and welcome back to my channel, Promoting Safety Engineering. My name is Toby Sheon Famtimi and thank you once again for being here. Um, to So you know, the station or this channel, all we talk do is talk about safety engineering and stuff just to do with safety. And um, so um, I want to, today I want to talk about uh, the topic of course you've all seen it's steps to be taken before a hazard study and um, this is just to enlighten you like okay and um, enlighten you on what to do when you've been called in to facilitate a hazard or maybe you're the maybe project engineer so you're the one supposed to get everything ready necessarily but me from here I'm looking at as I'm looking at it from the point of view as the facilitator or as the chairman of the HAZOP, which means you lead and guide everybody through the HAZOP procedure. And I'll just explain everything out. The video is going to, is useful for people who want to learn how to facilitate HAZOPs and also people who would be participants in a HAZOP. You would learn a lot from this. So, um, yeah, so let's get right into it. So there are 10 steps, I broke it down into 10 steps, although you can get as many from it as you'd like, but it's mainly into 10 steps and that's get the documents, risk matrix. I already, I broke it down into um, a lot more. So we'll go into that. So I'm looking at it from the point of view of you've been invited now or you bid to facilitate a hazard or you've been instructed that you're going to facilitate a hazard. You're going to be leading the entire team. So what are you going to do? So the very first step is get the documents. And I said three days prior, at least three days. That's so you can prepare for what you're going to do on because some hazards last for over a month, some two months, some three months. So um, this is let's say you have a hazard that's going to last that much long. You can't study all the documents and know everything. So just study what you could use for a day or two. And as the hazard goes on, you get fa you keep familiarizing yourself with all the documentation. So importantly, get the following documents and study them. That's prior to the hazard. So you get your PNIDs. That's the drawings. That's your, that's what you're going to be hazarding. You get everything and you study them or study as much as you can. Try to spot out the peculiar nature, the issues that might come up in the hazard. Try to have them pinpointed out because you should have a general idea of it. You can know everything because you are not the designer, but you should have a clear understanding of what is expected and especially issues that pop out at you you should note them down so that when in the in the workshop you can actually raise those uh, raise those issues and um, have a robust discussion on them then your pfds the pfds help show the flow from it, all the major equipments as the flow goes along in the system so this is very necessary it helps you understand the pnids easier and also during the workshop it helps you explain to the participants of the hazard um, how the flow goes although they should have an idea then the tor which is called a terms of reference or a chatter this is very necessary this is the documents that explains the methodology to be used, the venue of the HAZOP, the invitees of the, who, all the invitees, everyone that's going to be attending the HAZOP, um, the, the um, drawings that are going to be used, all the documents that are going to be used, it's all written in the TOR. So it's always good. Some HAZOPs, they do them without TORs or, or charters, but it's always good to have a terms of reference, something that you can go back to. It states what you should do before the HAZOP, how the hazard should be run and what happens after the hazard who closes out the action the action comments who signs off on each one and stuff like that it's very very necessary then your facility layouts you might need some layouts not to not to you might need it briefly but it's not so so important then the cost and effect metrics this is needed because you want to know okay if there's a trip what's um or there's a shutdown valve what triggers it the trips that are in place to match them or line them up to know okay what does this um 
what causes this to activate and what doesn't what causes this to open close and all that so you need this documents at least three days to the HAZOP. You get them, you study them in preparation for the HAZOP. So the next is your risk metrics. Now, I put this as if applicable. This normally shouldn't be a heading. It should be part of the documentation because when you get um, your documents, um, when you get um, note that there's going to be a HAZOP, they should tell you some HAZOPs are risk ranked, some are not risk ranked. It depends on what the client wants, but it and this and if it's risk ranked, they should actually give it to you. But I found out that in a lot of hazards, sometimes you get in and that is not. They are not. Um, you find out that maybe they want the hazard risk ranked, and they never actually told you, and you might have to now walk that in and rework your worksheets and all that. So it's always good to clearly ask for it before the hazard. Even if it doesn't appear in the TOR or the charter, ask for it because you might be surprised on that has update. So this is very necessary. That's why I put it as a separate slide. I there's, I have a video on risk matrices, matrices and you can go and watch it and study, uh, see how, how to use them. So it's good to get the risk matrix studied, know how, to, how it applies as regards the assets production loss reputation and all that the money monetary terms it's just to know um how severe a hazard is the impact the likelihood and all that so then the next step is after looking at your p and ids you are to break them down into nodes and that's kind of what i've done down here this is very very necessary because a hazard you might have like 50 drawings, 50 PNIDs, and you definitely are not going to run through that all very quickly. So uh, there are going to be various major equipments, uh, scrubbers, separators. I have a video on that to scrubbers, separators, pumps, and all that. You can watch that. So you, you, the best thing, uh, the way HAZOP is run is you're supposed to break it down into nodes around major equipments. There are various ways of making nodes um out of uh piano breaking her piano ids into nodes so um I, I i'm gonna have a video on that very soon although there's something on how to mark them up electronically you can watch that it will give you an idea but you have to break it down into nodes so you mark up the nodes electronically is better if you mark them up electronically so you can actually share them with the clients it's with the clients online instead of actually getting what people used to do before is actually get print out the drawings in black and white and get markers of various colors red blue green and all that and hand mark the drawings but it's not so neat it could be done better with just um adobe acrobat so you should um to mark them up electronically based on nodes then it's this is very critical you need to share it with the client or whoever the client representative is and agree on the nodes because i found out that sometimes you mark up nodes and you get into the hazard you're about to start and, they, and then you have suggestions why don't we break it into this why don't we separate this node into two or three smaller nodes why don't we do this and that so it's always good to have someone an authority from the client side and you look at it maybe the process engineer or the safety engineer or the pro project manager and you break it down into nodes you agree on it and have something concrete so that you can mark them up actually before the workshop you can also mark them up at the workshop with your um, markers but this is just better so you have them marked up electronically and you can print them out with a color printer and ha have them shared around for all the attendees then uh, you print out the colored nodes in a tree size so when you mark them up electronically as a hazard facilitator you should have your own copy of the pnids right in your hand which you would look through as the as you're leading the hazard you don't want to rely on on um, what you're showing up on the screen or from the projector then this is very very key your the success of your hazard might actually depend on this uh, scribe a scribe is very very important i scribed for lots of years before i started facilitating hazards and um, it's a good way to 
learn and know about about uh, the entire process and be part of it so you need a scribe firstly as i wrote out here get a good and reliable scribe that's so essential because if it's going on for a month you want someone that's reliable not someone that keeps popping out or getting distracted or comes to the has up late you need the person always there on time has your back that's your number two man then should be reasonably familiar with the methodology that's very very key he should know about how uh, how a has up is run he should so being there um, once he's scribing with you he should actually know the flow of the hazard like okay maybe we've looked at no flow are we going to look at more flow are we going to look at less flow and he should be able to kind of anticipate your moves not to a high degree but reasonably so that he's not lost in all the in the in the workshop a scribe is supposed to help you just type out everything record everything out in the hazard worksheets then she should be able to type well. He or she should be able to type well. That's very, very critical because you don't want the scribe holding down the hazard or slowing things down. It should actually complement you, not slow you down. So he or she should be on board fully and typing well instead of wait the entire workshop waiting for, he, for him or she to actually catch up to where you are then should be familiar with the worksheet know how to use the worksheet and if yours is a software you're going to be using like pha pro pha works he should know how to use that then and the layouts and have a general idea of the hazard document so reason why i'm saying i have a general idea is because running a hazard the scribe would mainly have the worksheet open but there's times you might want to have a quick look at the PNIDs or the layouts because you want to zoom in on some area in the layouts or the cost and effect metrics. He should have them all open on the computer he's using to scribe and know them so that immediately it's needed can easily open them up and just zoom in into the area being discussed. So that's very necessary. You need a very good scribe. I can't overemphasize this because it can mess up your entire work. Then your hazard worksheet before uh, before you go for the workshop, days prior, you should have your worksheet prepared or if it's the software, the software you're going to use. So prepare the worksheet prior to the HAZOP dates by. You can use either Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Word uh, for your worksheets or you can also use software like PHA Pro or PHA Works. So you set up each node section including the node number. So if it's node 1, node 2, node 3, the node title, if this node is going to be called HP Separator, this node is going to be called export pumps this node is going to be called mp compressor have them already written out break everything down into nodes the node intent are we flowing from here to here why are we do why why does this node exist to compress gas from five mega um from from five psi to 200 psi you that's the intent of this node and then the boundary this node starts exactly at this at this valve and ends at the um, downstream this vessel at this particular valve you need to ex clearly define the boundaries of each node then of course each of the headings as i wrote down here like you can see deviations courses guide words have everything written out clearly before you go in for the hazard this is very very essential you're going to record the pnid numbers based on what's in each node and there's so much information that you should have prepared before you go in so then um then you go into the attendees so this is very key in having a robust and successful has up a has up is only as good as the attendees at the has up because it's a combined experience nothing no um no suggestion is useless every Thing, when you raise it up everyone should actually consider it and make sure it makes sense it doesn't mean you should make a new sense of yourself but yeah you should if there are any issues that you can actually pinpoint you should actually raise it up for the facilitator to have a look at it then um so this is very key having the right people in the has up send out invites by email to attendees and it's could this could be done by the has up chairman or it could be done by the um, by the clients that the the company you're running the has up for, they could they could also 
bring in the invitees themselves. Then the number of attendees also, this may vary, but it's always good to try to avoid overcrowding. Normally, the ideal number would be maximum 10 to 15 people. You shouldn't have more than that, but I've been in hazards where we had 30 people and it's the facilitator just has to be able to control the floor of the hazard. So this is very, very key. You don't want too many people because there'll be distractions and you can have um, everyone, you want everyone contributing at the right time. Then ensure the correct people who can impact the positively are invited. Meaning you go through when, when um, your the invitees, people have been invited. You want to make sure the process, their instrumentation is there. You want to make sure um, operators are there because um, you want people who can actually contribute something meaningful to the hazard. So that's very key, getting the right attendees over. Then you should prepare a presentation, a hazard presentation on the methodology of a hazard. Pre um, prepare it. Um, it could be done in PowerPoints. It's just, it should last about five to 10 minutes. Just explaining, okay, this is how we do it. We break it. We've broken it down into nodes. These are the various nodes, and this is how we start. We start with no flow, more flow, less flow, and this is how we go through it. And we go with through with the nodes, the guide words, causes, consequences, recommendations. Explain everything because you might have people who have never been in a hazard there, or people who've just or who don't fully understand it. So you have to explain it to them so that they can fully participate. So then. It's always nice to have a safety moment. It could be done by you or by anyone else um, at the HAZOP, any of the attendees. Normally, the safety engineer should do it or the facilitator. It's just, it's, it's just to discuss a safety issue which might have something to do with the HAZOP or not, but just something to share, something safety-related. And then also you should have someone explain the emergency procedures of the venue. Like if you hear an alarm, where do you go to? Um, where are the escape routes? Do you use the, you don't use the elevator, you use the staircase. This is where the staircase is. This is where the convenience is. You need someone to explain all that because the attendees might not be familiar with the venue. And then also, if possible, you should have a projector. That's a projector of your own because normally the venue should provide a projector or a very large screen to um, ha which you have the worksheet on. Uh, but it's always good to have an extra one just in case um, you want to project something permanently for a while which and you don't want the scribe going back and forth between the worksheets because normally the worksheet should be constantly open throughout the hazard and then you should have um, either the PNIDs pasted in A1 on the walls or maybe have them in um, uh, on which your uh, second projector beaming on another screen so that if there is any discussion you can equi quickly look at the second screen from the projector and okay discuss it without actually interfering without um, without interfering with the worksheet. So it enables you to give visual presentation to the clients. Okay, and then make sure you're at the venue on time and you set up everything. So get to the venue with the scribe at least one hour ahead of start time. Set up the computer TV, use the projectors, make sure everything is in place, everything is working. If you if it's a really large room, you might need a PA system. Your voice might, you might not have a really loud voice like I do. And so um, you might need a microphone and a speaker to amplify your voice and then then also ensure all attendees have a copy of the mapped up has up notes and the necessary documents this is very necessary because you want them also to have their own pnids which they're following just as you're describing so Thank you very much. Those are all the things you need for, to have a lovely has up. It's been wonderful talking to you. If you have any questions, any suggestions, please send. You can email me or you can just drop a comment and I'll definitely read them and respond. So thank you all. Do have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel also. Thank you. It's promoting safety engineering. Bye.